In this video, I want to talk about the pathophysiological consequences of tachydystrophemia, um, and specifically what happens to our heart in the acute setting uh, from beating too fast, and what can happen chronically if this is happening on a regular basis. Um, and a lot of the core problems that occur as a result of tachydysrhythmia or why tachydysrhythmias are so bad for our heart is because it leads to an increased time in systole or not allowing for enough time for relaxation. So this heart that we can see uh, here is in diastole or it's the resting heart. And the reason that we need diastole is so that we can have some ventricular filling and ventricular perfusion. If you remember back to your anatomy and physiology classes, um, not only does our heart fill during diastole, or we're uh, increasing our preload or we're filling the heart with blood, so we'll label this as our preload. We're allowing for uh, filling at rest is also when the heart is being perfused. So when a muscle is contracted, it squeezes against the vessels and it's not getting nearly as much oxygen as it does uh, during diastole. So um, during diastole is when the coronary arteries supply the most oxygen uh, to our ventricle. So what happens in a tachydysrhythmia is we spend an excessive amount of time in systole. What I've drawn in this heart is a heart in systole. Um, that is you know, chronically contracting or contracting at a much higher rate than normal. So as a result, we see a number of things happen. One is we have decreased filling. If we're not spending enough time in diastole, we're not uh, waiting for all of the blood to exit the atria and we have you know, the atrial kick and all those things that are filling our left ventricle, we're gonna decrease our preload or we have decreased filling. So if we decrease uh, time for filling, What happens is we decrease our preload. So we decrease time for filling, which uh, in turn is going to decrease our preload. So one of the big problems with uh, tachydysrhythmia or with a heart rate that is too fast is we decrease filling time and we don't have enough, as much blood in the ventricle to eject. The other problem is kind of like we mentioned before is as the ventricle contracts and as the muscles are contracted, we actually put pressure on our coronary arteries. So we start to see pressure on the coronary arteries, which means that they cannot supply as much oxygen to the tissues. So we start shutting down oxygenation. So the more time spent in systole, uh, or systole, the less time or the less oxygenation to our myocardium we have. So one of the other large problems here, one of the big problems with uh, increased uh, heart rate or excessively increased heart rate is we have decreased uh, time for myocardial perfusion. And if you think about the consequence of that is that if we have decreased time for myocardial uh, perfusion and we have decreased oxygenation of our myocardial cells, we see decreased oxygenation uh, of our myocardial cells, we can actually start to see ischemia. So we start to see some ischemia of the myocardial cells. which is also gonna be a problem. So we can see some of these cells become ischemic or they're not getting the oxygen they need um, and they are not going to be able to contract as well. The final problem is that we are gonna increase workload. So the faster the heart has to beat, the, uh, the more oxygen it's gonna demand or the, the more that muscle is working. So picture running a marathon. Um, or cycling on a bike. The more revolutions per minute, the more you're gonna work your muscles and the more oxygen they're gonna demand. The same thing is going on with the heart uh, here. So the more time or the increased amount of time we spend in uh, systole means the increased myocardial oxygen demand, oxygen demand we have. We're increasing our MbO2. Um, we're also increasing our workload. Well, the heart has to work harder. So in the short term, we have three things that really aren't so great. Um, and if we take a look at our equation of cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, you initially would look at this and think, well, an increase in heart rate is going to lead to an increase in cardiac output. But we're not talking about just any increase in heart rate. We're talking about a dramatic increase in heart rate or a pathological increase in heart rate. And to understand why this leads to a decrease in cardiac output, we should talk about the things that kind of make up our stroke volume. So we know that our stroke volume is made up of preload, 
made up of contractility. It's made up of afterload. So preload, afterload, and contractility. So if you think about the things we talked about, this increase in heart rate is going to decrease filling time and decrease preload. So we see decreased filling, which means we have a decrease in preload. If we think about our contractility, we also are going to have a decrease in contractility. We know we have an increase in MVO2, but we have a decrease in oxygenation. So as a result, we can start to see some ischemia or we have a myocardial cells that are going to decrease their function. So those are the kind of major consequences that we can see um, in the short term or in the acute setting in uh, tachydysrhythmia. So these are kind of our acute consequences. Now, if we think about the long-term consequences, is if someone goes in and out of tachydysrhythmia, it can lead to heart failure. So either they're going to be able to supply their muscles with enough oxygen and they're going to get a hypertrophy of the left ventricle, which can lead to heart failure. Or if you combine this with something like an ACS, uh, the person may lead to dilation of their left ventricle, which can lead to um, a, a forward failure of the left ventricle. So the other thing I want to talk about in terms of tachycardia arrhythmia is what are some of the signs and symptoms we can see? Um, so I've drawn kind of a little person over here, and I want to look at the signs and symptoms of our uh, tachydysrhythmia. So if you think about it, um, and you think about some of the things we've talked about, um, we can see a number of different signs and symptoms for this patient. I think the most obvious one is going to be palpitations. So as the heart starts to beat too fast, or we have this excessive heart uh, beat, the person may complain of palpitations. So palpitations, they may complain of a racing heart or fluttering in their chest. Um, that is uh, the result of, of really just the heart beating too quickly. Now, the other thing that we mentioned is that we can have ischemia. And we know that as we have ischemia of our myocardial cells, so, so draw some ischemia in here, we're going to have a release of toxic metabolites or cellular metabolites, which can lead to pain. So this patient may actually complain of an ischemic uh, chest pain or ischemic pain pattern. So because the metabolites are being released and the ischemia is occurring very similarly to someone who might be having, say, an acute coronary syndrome or have a blockage of a coronary artery, uh, in this case, there's no blockage, but it's the fact that we're spending so much time in systole, we're increasing workload and not supplying enough oxygen to those tissues, they become ischemic just like anything else. So this may be that, you know, visceral hard to explain radiating chest pain. And it's up to us to decide whether this pain is the result of um, you know, acute coronary syndrome or is the result of the patient's palpitations. And I think if we're making treatment decisions based on this, a lot of the time we have to decide uh, how, at how high a risk is patient of having ACS. Um, as we have a falling cardiac output, so we've discussed uh, previously we have a decrease in cardiac output or cardiac output is falling. We see decreased blood flow to the periphery. So as a result, uh, we may see uh, low blood pressure. Um, you may feel absent perf uh, peripheral pulses. Or you may even feel an irregularity. So the heart rate may be regular, but you might feel a pulse deficit as you're not getting, uh, or the patient's not ejecting blood or ejecting enough blood um, with every beat. So we might see a um, pulse deficit from the monitor. Another thing that you can see in uh, tachydysrhythmia is you may see JVD in the patient. So you may see some jugular vein distension. And if you think about what's happening is if I'm spending much more time in systole, I'm not allowing for filling, all of this blood that is returning to the heart. So we have uh, blood returning to the heart from the periphery. Well, it was trying to return to the heart, but the heart is not accepting it. We can see an increase in pressure behind the heart. So uh, increased pressure in our vena cava, which can lead to jugular vein distension. Um, so you may see JVD, and you may uh, actually even see something called a cannon A wave or pulsations in the jugular vein. And what's happening there is as the vena cava are trying to return blood to the heart, 
the ventricle is contracted, so the right ventricle is contracted. So as blood tries to return, it's basically pumping against a closed door. So it actually, um, you see that pressure increase, you almost see a backup or the wave um, of the blood hitting the closed uh, right ventricle and popping back up into the vena cava. So we see JVD, see cannon A waves, Um, these patients obviously may complain of some things like lightheadedness or dizziness as our cardiac output falls. So lightheaded, dizzy. They may have syncopal episodes or all those uh, indications that our cardiac output is um, falling. Um, with the ischemic chest pain, these patients may be diaphoretic as well. So it's really important that we start looking at this patient and deciding um, what uh, their signs and symptoms are related to a blockage of the coronary artery, or is this all rate related? Um, so again, the big problems are the uh, three main things that we look at in terms of tachydysrhythmia that uh, lead to acute pathology is one, we start to see decreased filling time. Two, we have a decrease in uh, oxygenation, or we have uh, too much time in systole leads to decreased uh, myocardial oxygen supply. And finally, uh, the last problem is that we are increasing workload, or we start to see an increase in MVO2 because we're forcing the heart to work harder.